Welcome and thank you for joining our first virtual lunchtime talk of the fall season. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Aaron, who is project coordinator for Crotros, the Institute's Squeeze Digitization Project. Aaron did his undergraduate work at the University of Maryland College Park, where he received dual degrees in classical languages and literature and English literature. As a Fulbright Fellow and Associate Member of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, Aaron spent the 2014-15 academic year pursuing a research project on Athenian tribute lists. Um, you might be able to tell us a little bit more about those um, if there's time, Aaron. Um, he recently completed his PhD in classics at Rutgers with a dissertation exploring demagogic politicians and political leadership in Imperial Athens. Some of his other major projects include exploring thesis role in Athenian history and using a modern spreadsheet program to statistically analyze Athenian financial instruments. In addition to collaboration with the Institute of Christian Oriental Research at Catholic University of America to scan their squeezes of inscriptions found in the southernmost part of the Arabian Peninsula, Aaron has recently joined with Rachel Starry of UC Riverside and Natalie Sussman of MIT uh, to form the new planning committee for ancient maker spaces um, for an event at the joint annual meetings of the Society of Classical Studies and the Archaeological Institute of America. We're delighted that Aaron has taken the time to join us today to discuss his work with the Institute's collection of epigraphic squeezes. Um, and before we begin, I would like to extend a special welcome to our friend Annette Merle Smith, who's with us today, um, a person who has generously provided support for the Squeeze Digitization Project over the last several years. Thank you, Annette. We express our great gratitude to you. I think it was your support that helped to inspire the uh, wonderful um, support of the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, which um, we've gotten a very significant grant um, in the spring. So if you would all please mute your audio, I think you may be uh, muted and there will be time for questions and discussion following the talk. Off to you, Aaron. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, and thanks to all of you for taking time out on your Friday uh, to join me and hear about squeezes. Uh, and I hope uh, that some of you may be in places where the weather is better than it is in New Jersey right now, where we have rain and cold. Um, but if not, at least we have uh, hopefully a fun event to take some of that time up um, when we can't be outside enjoying the last bit of fall. So let me share my screen and we'll get off to the races. So giving the past a digital squeeze. Um, I'm going to start by giving a little bit of an overview of epigraphy and squeezes, uh, because I'm aware that some of you may not be familiar with epigraphic squeezes. So for those in the audience who are uh, hardened epigraphists, bear with me as we go through this. Um, so. What is epigraphy? So epigraphy comes from the Greek words epi and graphene, which mean to write on. And essentially, epigraphy is the study of any text that's written onto something. Uh, and we generally exclude from that things like manuscripts and papyri, the kind of normal versions of writing, the normal materials that writing is passed down on. So it's texts that are inscribed into stone, texts that are inscribed into metal, uh, texts that are inscribed into somewhat unusual and often more durable surfaces. And this places epigraphy at a really interesting intersection point where archaeology, paleography, the study of lettering, um, philology, the study of words, and history all meet. Um, and it's particularly important in the kind of Greco-Roman historical tradition because of something that's called the epigraphic habit. And the epigraphic habit is essentially that for reasons that we don't really know and don't entirely understand, the ancient Greeks decided that they were going to write down an enormous amount of documentation on stone, on really durable materials. Um, uh, so that could be anything from 
things that we would think of as being normally written on stone, gravestones, uh, dedication inscriptions on buildings, things that we're familiar with now, to documents that we really don't think of as normally being carved into stone, like essentially tax records. So the Athenian tribute lists, um, which Pamela mentioned and, and are one of the objects of my study, are essentially records of donations that were um, mandatorily extracted from the allies of Athens by Athens. And then a part of those, one sixtieth of those were given as a tithe to the goddess Athena um, and to her temple for holding on to that money because temples were used as banks in antiquity extensively. And all of that financial information, all of those numbers, who had brought what in and what had been tithed to Athena, was carved on enormous stone plinths. And we'll get a chance to actually see a picture of one of those plinths later on. So there's financial information, there are honorific decrees, um, there are all sorts of things that are recorded, many of which are objects are, are notions that are not necessarily of interest to the professional historians who are writing at the time. So we would know almost nothing about the economics of the Athenian empire in the 400s BC without these inscriptions, without the fragments of them that survive. We would know very little that is firsthand reporting of slaves or of women in antiquity because they were for the most part not the authors that survived to us um, were it not for inscriptions where we often have women um, who are the voices and the writers of grave inscriptions. We often have slaves uh, who are the voices and the writers of grave inscriptions. Um, and Angelos Haniotis, the professor of classics and ancient history at the Institute, has worked extensively on these inscriptions uh, by slaves and by women and, and how to tell uh, kind of when they're legitimately voicing those kinds of uh, people and when they're sort of written by masters on behalf of slaves. So this provides a lot of crucial information for ancient history and culture and for understanding these things. So that's what epigraphy is. And what is a squeeze? Uh, and here we have a picture of Angelos making a squeeze, um, an example squeeze in, in our office in the Merritt Library um, in better times when we were allowed to be there together. And we'll have some more. You'll see this picture again, actually, in, in its context a little bit later on. But essentially, squeezes are paper negatives of these materials, these inscribed um, stones. And so a squeeze doesn't necessarily have to be of a text. Um, we had Nora Oka, uh, an artist, architect, and historian, as one of the director's visitors at the Institute last year, and she made a, a fantastic artistic squeeze of one of the columns um, near from near Princeton. Um, and so that has no really no writing on it at all that's captured and is in fact just an architectural member. So anything that's got dimensionality to it, you can make a squeeze out of. The collection at the Institute is specifically interested in epigraphic squeezes, so squeezes of text carved into things. So essentially you take acid-free filter paper, and the reason that you take this special paper is, one, it's high wet strength. Um, so as we're all familiar with, if you took something like a tissue or toilet paper and got it wet, it would immediately come to pieces on you, it would disintegrate. And the way that we create these impressions is by getting the paper wet. So you need something that's not gonna just come to pieces in your hands when you get it wet. And because it's acid free, it will be slow to deteriorate. And this is really important for collections like the one at the Institute because most of the squeezes at the Institute were made in the 1920s, 1930s and 1940s. They're mostly in fantastic shape. Um, and were they made from acid high paper, um, they would be in much worse shape. You can think of if you have cheap paperbacks hanging around from the 1940s or 50s, they are in terrible shape, right? They disintegrate, it's very hard to keep them up. So you get that paper wet, you apply it to the stone, which is what Angelos is doing here, and you force it into the crevices with a brush by patting it with a brush. And then once it dries, you remove it, and it contains that negative of the inscription surface. So here we have an inscription that's in Athens in the theater of Dionysus. Um, and 
this is what the squeeze in the inscription in the collection um, at the Institute looks like. So you can see that it's backwards, right? This is what the original inscription looks like. Um, so we have this P Ilio P here um, going straight across and here P Ilio is backwards on this side. Um, but it does a really nice job of capturing the feeling of all the letters, the actual look of all of the letters. So that leads us to the collection at the Institute. So why does the Institute have the second largest collection of epigraphic squeezes in the world? How did this happen? Well, the background to that is essentially one man and that's Benjamin Dean Merritt. And Benjamin Dean Merritt was one of the first two professors at the Institute in the area of humanistic studies as it was called at the time, which eventually became um, the School of Historical Studies now. Um, and this is a picture of, on the left, uh, Benjamin Dean Merritt, and on the right, Abraham Flexner, the first director and kind of um, divisor of the Institute. And this picture is actually from the 1920s. So Merritt and Flexner were friends and knew each other well before the Institute really got kicked off and certainly before Merritt became a faculty member at the Institute. Uh, so Merritt's... Um, correspondence is held by the archives. And in fact, this picture comes from the Shelby White and Leon Levy Archive Center at the Institute. Um, and Merritt's correspondence with Flexner is preserved by the Institute, is available on Albert, our database. And so you can read the letters that they wrote back and forth and you can see how close they were. They spent summers in Canada together quite frequently and knew each other very well. And here we have a recommendation um, of Merritt to Flexner in 1931 by Edward C. Armstrong, who was at the time the chairman of the ACLS, the American Council of Learned Societies. So here in 1931, um, they've already got the real idea for the mathematical school, what they're gonna do with that down, but they're trying to figure out, Flexner's trying to figure out what he's going to do as far as the rest of the Institute. Uh, and there's, a lot of recommendation, it's, it's interesting because it's similar in some ways to what we're going through at the, the present moment. Um, there's a lot of recommendation that so much money is being put into scientific research. So much money is being put into practical studies and there's relatively little funding and effort being put into humanistic studies. And there's a real concern that a lack of understanding of humanistic studies of how people work and how they get along is responsible for, you know, at the time, this is 1931, for the rising tides of, of fascism in Europe. Um, and so we've got this heavy recommendation to Flexner, if you can, humanistic studies would be extremely important, we think, for moving the world forward. So they recommend Benjamin D. Merritt, um, PhD, Princeton, professor at the time at Michigan. Um, by the time he actually gets hired by the Institute, he's already moved to Johns Hopkins, uh, age 32, and gives a little bit of an overview of him as an option. And here we've flashed forward about four years um, and Flexner sends a, a letter to Professor Arnold Toynbee um, in 1935 telling him about the creation of the School of Humanistic Studies and explaining its initial composition, um, which is a young Hellenist uh, who will be at Oxford in the autumn, Professor Merritt of Johns Hopkins University, um, and then also one of Hitler's exiles, as he describes him, an art historian, Professor Erwin Panofsky. So we have the very beginning of the School of Humanistic Studies here. Um, and one of those kind of cornerstones is Merritt, who's brought on at the age of 35 um, in 1935 and expected to stay at the Institute uh, until he is 65, if not extended longer. So he's really expected to be one of the main cornerstones uh, of the School of Humanistic Studies at the Institute. Um, and this is kind of a, a fun little piece. This is another piece from the archives um, that has to do with the sending of the squeezes over. Um, so here we have cases of um, Greek inscriptions. Of course, they're not actually Greek inscriptions. Um, they're facsimiles um, for the library, right? This is describing the squeezes and 
asking that they not be um, tariffed as they come over. Um, so they should be considered as similar to photographs or prints or facsimiles like that, um, and not as uh, artworks or something that would be taxed under the Tariff Act. So here in 1936, when we flash forward one year, um, we have those cases of inscriptions coming over to the Institute. Um, and a little bit later, um, we have a report uh, of Benjamin Merritt where he describes what he has been doing. So the interesting thing about Merritt's appointment is that it happened in 1935, but at the time that he was appointed, he had already accepted um, an offer from Oxford to spend the year as a scholar at Oxford. Um, and this was a, a great honor. And so the Institute was very happy to have him do this, but it did mean that his first year at the Institute, he was not, not at the Institute. Um, and he was in fact at Oxford and then also working at Athens. And a big part of that work at Athens was that he was one of the main members of the managing committee of the American School of Classical Studies. And in that position, he was part of the team that was running the newly started um, Agora excavations. So the ancient Agora at Athens was um, kind of handed over to the American School for Management in 1932. And the particular portion of that dig that Ben Merritt was responsible for was the epigraphy, were the inscriptions. So as things came out of the ground, he was responsible for publishing them, for getting them into press. And he notes here that in addition to publishing these newly discovered inscriptions, one of the things he did during his year abroad um, was procure, obtain for the Institute uh, a complete collection of squeezes um, of all the inscriptions in the Epigraphical Museum and at the Agora, at Eleusis, and on the Acropolis. So he had talked to um, Dr. Flexner and to the board um, at the Institute about getting some money to create this collection, which would really allow him to continue top of the line epigraphic work from Princeton without having to be in Athens um, every time that he wanted to write about one of the inscriptions. Um, and he says that this is the nucleus of what he hopes will be the most complete collection of squeezes in America um, and a very valuable reference collection for any epigraphical work by all scholars on this side of the Atlantic. Um, and notes also some other collections that he was able to get a hold of while he was in, um, in, in England. So while at Oxford, he also got the collection um, of the Ashmolean Museum. Uh, there was a scholar at Oxford who he had spent some time um, conversing with and working with named William H. Buckler, who gave him his entire collection from the Sardis excavations. Um, and all of those had come over by now, we saw the kind of um, request for no tariff. So they had finally made their way over to Princeton. Um, and here we have another note um, from Merritt to um, Flexner, where he explains that a former associate in Athens, Charles Edson, uh, had reported that he had secured a complete set of squeezes from the district of Botiaia uh, in Macedonia for the Institute, um, and had spent two months in the field making the squeezes, which Merritt furnished the, the paper for. So essentially the Institute paid for the squeezes on the condition that the Institute received one set. Um, and so this essentially explains uh, what the collection is, and, and I'll come back to that in, in just a second, but this is a, a neat little um, bit as well. Merritt was very involved in what the squeeze collection and what the working room would look like down to the point that he sent on semi-architectural drawings of how he envisioned his laboratory, as he called it, being laid out. Um, so here you can see that he's got this detail of how the cases for filing squeezes um, were going to be made, what the shelf uh, construction was going to look like. Of course, as with any of these things, um, you know, plans are great until we actually run into battle. And so this is not what things eventually ended up looking like. Um, this is a picture of me relatively recently, as you can tell by the mask, um, in B101, B Building 101, which is the Merritt Library. And you can see behind me what the um, 
kind of facilities for storing the squeezes look like. And so it's not exactly the way that he laid out, but it's not that far from it. Uh, there are these wooden frames within which sets of boxes can be placed. And these um, acid-free boxes are what store the majority of our squeeze collection. So this is what we look like now. So we have these connections between Benjamin Merritt and the Agora at Athens, the Epigraphic Museum. Um, this is kind of what, what frames the core of the collection. And because Merritt had these deep connections with Athens uh, and Attica, and that was where his research interests primarily lay, that's where the heart of our squeeze collection is. And this is true for the library at the Institute as well. Uh, if you talk to Marsha Tucker, for example, um, at the, the Historical Studies and Social Studies Library, um, she'll tell you that the library is a reflection of the scholars who have worked and lived at the Institute. So it's extraordinarily complete, kind of best in the world in some areas. Um, and less filled in other areas because it's kind of a living thing. And, and the same is true for the squeeze collection. Um, so we have this thing that is a, a reflection of Ben Merritt. And as such, it is super complete for Athens and Attica. Um, and so we can take a look here. This is kind of where most of the squeezes we have come from. Uh, and apologies for this being a French map. It was the best looking map I could find. And, and I figured that um, having some French names on here wouldn't bother people too much. Um, so the vast majority of what we have come from that little square, Attica, where Athens is, is featured, um, as well as Eleusis. But then we also have a variety of materials from Macedonia, which you can see up to the north. Um, so Greek Macedonia, not the, the current uh, Republic of Northern Macedonia. Um, and we have a lot of material from Asia Minor, the, the um, western coast of Turkey, which was um, largely Greek in antiquity. Uh, and a lot of the Asia Minor material came from later bequests from scholars. So we heard about William Buckler uh, donating the materials from Sardis. David M. Robinson also donated materials from his excavations in Asia Minor, as did uh, Louis Robert. So there have been a lot of eminent archaeologists, uh, especially American archaeologists, but um, with some variety in, in nationality as well, who have ultimately donated their collections to the Institute, um, since it's a, an excellent research location for using squeezes. In terms of numbers, we have about 30,000 squeezes. Um, we're not sure exactly how many there are. When I got to the Institute, the uh, estimates that were floating around were somewhere between 25,000 and 75,000. Um, so we really had absolutely no idea. At this point, we've kind of narrowed it down a bit as we've been doing a lot of the digitization and cataloging process. And it, it would not surprise me if we ended up having somewhere in the 35,000 range, but I would be quite surprised if, if it was much more than that. So we've got these squeezes. Why digitize them? As I mentioned at the beginning, inscriptions are vital sources for the history of the ancient Mediterranean. Uh, we can't write most of our history books about ancient Greece without squeezes, or without inscriptions, I should say. And most inscriptions are at least partially restored. Um, that is to say, I think if we pull up, this is a great example. So um, this is me and a colleague working in the Epigraphic Museum. And as you can see, most squeezes are not, or most inscriptions are not like that beautiful inscription that I led off with when I started the talk, which was all of the lettering was there. It was a single block. It looked like it was in pretty good shape. Most inscriptions look more like this. Um, and this is what's called the lapis primus, the first stone of the Athenian tribute lists. And as you can see, in this case, it's an enormous concrete structure that has a lot of marble fragments put into it. So the original marble plinth would have been the size and shape, more or less, of this large concrete structure. But unfortunately, this um, marble plinth was on the Acropolis. Among other things, at one point, uh, I believe the Turks were storing gunpowder in the Parthenon and it exploded. That's why the Parthenon looks the way that it does. Um, and so, you know, 2,500 years, we'll do some rough things even to stone. 
So most inscriptions look like this. They're super fragmentary um, and they're not necessarily very well preserved. And we'll have a good chance to look at that a little bit later. But because they're restored, right? There are letters that we can't see and we have to guess at, we have to make up. Um, and there are letters that don't fully survive and we're guessing what letters those are. Assessing the text properly requires looking at the surface of the stone and not just at a publication. Uh, because a published text is going to give you, you know, what that person's best guess is, but it's not a picture. It's not the surface of the stone. You can't argue with the publication, with the text, um, about whether that's an omega um, or actually, no, that's an omicron, right, which could, could be important. So squeezes were one of the ways that we could work on inscriptions meaningfully in multiple places at the same time. But that's then when we didn't really have great ways of digitizing. Um, and so squeezes were kind of our best bet for that. Unfortunately, that meant that schools that didn't have collections of squeezes, that didn't have collections of inscriptions, and this is most schools in the United States, um, can't really teach students how to do epigraphy. You, it's very difficult to learn how to read inscriptions if you have no way of looking at the surface of inscriptions. Um, and so we don't have a lot of epigraphists in the US. It's very difficult to train people without these resources. So we want to democratize the profession of epigraphy, right? We want everyone who has an interest to be able to learn how to do this. And the way that we do that is by creating a really large image database, a usable image database of inscriptions. Um, and squeezes represent a really easy way to do this because if we look again at this image, this is a relatively small portion of the 15,000 inscriptions in one museum in Athens. Um, it would take a very long time to photograph all of these stones. Um, it would take an even longer time to wander around the rest of Athens, Attica, Greece, Asia Minor, to get pictures of all of these possible inscriptions and really good lighting, you know, well set up. Um, also, some of these inscriptions that we've made squeezes of in, say, 1936 were hanging out in the countryside of northern Greece in 1937, 1938, 1939, 1940. Uh, and some of you may be aware, a rather big war happened during that time that involved a lot of fighting and bombing in those areas. So some of the squeezes that we have are of stones that we know no longer exist. Um, so they are, are preservations of that. Um, so we're going to create this big image database um, from these squeezes, and it'll allow more and more people to be epigraphists. And there's also some really exciting deep learning potential with a large image database, because you can turn computers loose on these large image databases uh, and teach them how to read letters. And there are some people who are already doing this. Um, and one of the, the people who works closely with our project is Steve Tracy, Professor Emeritus from uh, The Ohio State University, who has spent his life learning how to detect the handwriting of individual masons, of individual stone carvers. And unfortunately, it turns out that that is a skill that no one in a university wants to hire someone for doing. So Steve has not been able to pass that knowledge on to another generation of students. Um, and we're concerned that that knowledge will leave when Steve leaves. Um, so we're trying to figure out ways to get computers to do this kind of stuff that is critical for the field, but perhaps not appreciated enough by the field uh, to be sustained. So how do we digitize? Um, well, we're going to start with what we what we don't do. Um, so. Some of you may be familiar with, with these options, RTI and photogrammetry. Both of these are 3D digitization solutions. Um, so RTI, which we can pull up, um, RTI looks like this. Um, RTI is essentially taking, and, and actually it's what I was doing in that picture with my colleague at the Epigraphic Museum. Um, it's taking pictures of a object, of a stone, for example, with the camera in a still position and a light source moving around, and then using a computer algorithm to uh, turn those multiple photos into a kind of 3D object. So for example, I can move the light source around and you can see the depth in letters 
much better with low angle raking light, for example, than you would be able to see when the light is straight on. Um, and I can also bring up a mode that's called normals visualization that essentially gives a depth map of the object. Um, so this is one way of digitizing, but the problem is that to do this, it requires either 15 minutes or so to make one of these when you're doing it by hand, or you can make a dome to do it, um, and then it would take two to three minutes. But unfortunately, we have a lot of squeezes that are, let's say, um, at least three foot by two foot, um, a lot that are in that, that range, and some that are much larger than that, some that are up to 10 feet long by six feet wide. Um, this is a small chunk of a single inscription. This is um, all of maybe eight inches by five inches. Um, to get larger than that with any kind of resolution requires incredible camera technology uh, and would require us to build a dome that was literally the size of a room. Um, so that's not really a great option, right? That's not particularly efficient. Uh, and unfortunately, the same is more or less true for photogrammetry. Um, and so this is a photogrammetric scan uh, of an inscription at the um, Agora in Athens. One of the upsides to um, RTI is that it's very good at capturing the face of an object. Um, it doesn't really do in the round so much. Photogrammetry is much better for capturing an object in the round. So you can see we really got um, all sides of an object. Photogrammetry is also particularly great for capturing color information because it's made by taking a lot of photos uh, and then kind of mashing them together. And you can actually see some of the inscri inscribed text on this. Um, but there are a couple of problems. One is it takes a very long time to do photogrammetry. Um, and two is it's really good at capturing this in the round colorized information. But with squeezes, we don't really care about in the round colorized information. We just want that kind of flat side and we don't, don't need the color. Um, so a lot of what photogrammetry is really great at, we don't need. Um, and it's, it also creates very large files. So this is an issue with both RTI and photogrammetry that they create really large files. And we wanna make this available to people. Um, and so for this to be available and you know easy enough to download and easy enough to use, we didn't really want to start here, um, to start with something this complicated. So we set these aside and we decided what we were going to do was to scan the squeezes. So we use a wide tech um, 25600 flatbed scanner, which is an 18.5 inch by 25 inch flatbed scanner. Um, and I think we have a picture of the scanner here. This is what our scanners look like. We have two of them. Um, so we use that scanner. We have a 3D lighting setting on it, um, which essentially is low angle lighting. So you saw how well that low angle lighting on the RTI made the letters pop. Um, and this scanner has a way to do that. So it really makes the, the images pop. Um, and we do it in grayscale because we don't care about the color information. We just care about that depth information. And we create these really high resolution images, these 600 dot per inch TIFF files for our um, archival purposes. And then we kind of bring them down in size to smaller 300 DPI JPEGs so that we can put them up online. We also scan every squeeze twice. We scan, scan it once upright, and then we kind of rotate it 90 degrees and scan it again, because that low angle lighting is really good at catching objects that are perpendicular to it but it doesn't have much to catch if the object is parallel. So by turning it, we end up not losing lines. Um, then we take all of those uh, images. If we've rotated it, we unrotate it. Um, we also have the great advantage on the computer that we don't have to be looking at it as if it were in a mirror, right? We're not needing to look at it right to left and, and read backwards for everything. We can just tell Photoshop to flip the thing and it'll flip it. Um, and then we adjust the brightness a little bit, contrast a little bit to make it as readable as possible. Like I said, we have some really, really large squeezes, right? We've got some that are like six foot by 10 foot. For those that are really that large, 
we scan them multiple times on the scanner. So we kind of pick it up and move it through as if it were, you know, on a, on a pizza bed or something like that. Uh, and then we photo merge all of those pictures together. So we leave enough overlap that Photoshop can take all those various images and stitch them all together into one picture. Um, and then, like I said, pull them down in size and we put the small ones up online um, and the unadjusted ones, the full resolution ones, all of the previous work throughs, we keep that material um, so that if people think that something we did um, influenced the ultimate image, if people think that we'd be better off not doing the adjustments, they can have access to those untouched original images because we're trying to approach this scientifically uh, and impart as little of our bias as possible on it. This is what the scan looks like when it's done. Um, so this is that uh, inscription that we had seen at the beginning. And you can see it's flipped back around. We have P ILEO, P F again at the top. Um, and you can see that it really lights up the letters really nicely. Um, and this is of course, just one of the two. We would have another, another rotation that would have the light coming from a different angle. From here, um, we go, we have a website and a database. Um, so we can kind of show you what those look like. Um, and I'm not going to go into detail on the website or the data, but if you have questions about it, we can definitely hit that during the Q&A. Um, so this is kind of what our website looks like. Uh, and if you flip over, um, this is what our database looks like, which is on Albert, um, the Institute's uh, DSpace database. Okay, so let's go back. Um, so um, let's skip over that for now. But where we are for now, we've scanned about 25,300 of the squeezes. Um, we've gotten metadata done for about 12,000 of the ones we've scanned. And a lot of the squeezes are not necessarily going to have heavy metadata for them because they may never have been published. If they're inscriptions that have never been published, there's not a lot of information to gather. So that's a lot shorter. These are, these are ones that have a lot of, a lot of information. Um, we've not uploaded that many. So we've only uploaded 2,683. And the reason that we've uploaded as few as we have is that we are working on a new digital architecture. Um, we're working on changing the way that we put these things online um, so that they are more machine accessible so that other people can use them better. Um, so we're moving to an XML way of doing things, uh, an extended markup language, a computer readable way of doing things. Um, and that's going to help ensure that we're continuing con to connect to linked data um, for the rest of the ancient world. Um, we're also working on figuring out preservation and housing plans for the squeeze collection. Um, and Annette's uh, support is going to be really critical in making sure that the squeezes, even after they're digitized, are well kept um, and are still available you know, for generations beyond this one. Um, and we are as uh, Pamela said, fortunate to have an NEH grant, which is going to allow us to do things like include 3D digitization, which we weren't sure would originally be part of our plan. So we're researching what the appropriate technology for that will be. Um, and I'll kind of close by saying that outreach is obviously one of the major things we're doing. We want people to use this, um, whether it's for scholarship or just for enjoyment, um, to look at the images, to, to enjoy these um, treasures of the ancient world that until now, you kind of had to be in Princeton and, and at the Institute to get, and now the Institute is sharing them um, with everyone openly. And so one of the ways that we've done that is we've had, um, I have a, an ongoing collaboration with the Latin master at the Lawrenceville School, uh, just down the road in, from Princeton. And we've brought one of the classes from the Lawrenceville School into the Institute, into uh, the Merit Collection to work with the squeezes. Um, we're going to be doing another year of collaboration this year. Obviously, at the moment, we can't bring them in. Um, but hopefully, things will be better in the spring and we'll be able to get them by. So we have some photos um, that I'll just kind of go through relatively quickly that are of that visit. Um, so you can see again, the image of Angelos. Um, this is the class coming by. They got to make help make the squeeze. Um, here, Angelos is pulling it off. Um, they got to sit down with the squeezes from the collection, try to read the images. You know, These are folks in 
introductory Greek. This is one year of Greek, um, and they were already happy and ready to to get in um, to identify letters, try to figure out what the squeezes were saying. Um, you could see working with you know cameras so that you get that raking light. The same thing that we were doing with the RTI. Uh, this gives you a good idea of of how much that raking light makes a difference. Um, so had a chance to have people come by and we're really excited to continue doing work like that and bringing people in and, and bringing the squeezes out um, to the greater world. Um, so thank you all for listening. I look forward to, to taking your questions. Um, and, you know, before closing, I'd like again to really gratefully acknowledge the support of um, the NEH, the Charles and Lisa Simone Fund uh, for Arts and Sciences, and of course, uh, Nett and, and her support in memory of Fowler Merle Smith, uh, which really got us kicked off and, and has um, gotten us through with this project. So we're, we're ever so grateful. Aaron, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate your having um, your ability, your uh, openness to taking questions. Um, can I just ask a quick question to start things off? How many do you have um, statistics on um, how many um, scholars or individuals have have accessed the collection so far? What you have available online? So it's a little bit hard to tell because the the statistics for tracking Albert are not great at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so we've tried to do that a little bit through um, some of the Google analysis um, materials. And as best we can tell it, and part of the the issue with this is that it's a little bit hard to tell what's a legitimate interaction from that kind of um, statistical analysis, as opposed to a bot of some kind that's you know trolling through the internet for right. whatever it may be. Um, but we have seen that we get a significant amount of um, of interaction with the collection from a lot of places, um, and among them, actually, I was at a an epigraphy conference in January. Um, and one of the attendees is from Japan. Um, and so I was chatting about him and he was talking about how difficult it is to find good images and, and stuff like that. And so I mentioned what I was doing and, and we exchanged cards and he said, oh, well, I already use your database. Mm -hmm. um, so it is clearly, it's out there. Um, people are working with it. People are familiar with it. Um, we also, have a number of requests from scholars who are kind of familiar with the collection um, for materials that we haven't gotten up yet. Um, and we're always happy to um, digitize things if they haven't been digitized or if they are just not posted yet, get them out over to them. So we had one of those um, just a couple of weeks ago where someone wanted um, the squeezes from Colophon. And so we got all those digitized and got them up online. And um, they've already put a, a ton of those images in the um, kind of uh, end notes for one of their forthcoming publications. So um, we're definitely, we're getting use. We were getting use from a wide geographic area, which we were really excited about. Um, and we've already had a couple of, of scholars who have started incorporating our images into their publications. Terrific, thank you. Other questions? Um, I'm going to ask one more that I had written down. Um, what, um, can you tell me anything about the collaboration um, that you're doing with um, the Classics um, Department at Princeton? Mm. Um, I know you, you were working with Harriet Flower there and... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was, that was one of the biggest um, bummers for us about the timing of the shutdown um, mm. was that we had planned to do a, a small um, squeeze making workshop with in, in collaboration with the Princeton Classics Department. And so it was originally planned for, the, I think, the very beginning of April. 
um, we were going to get together. Um, Nora Oka was kind of back over for a, a period of time. Um, there, we brought over a bunch of squeeze brushes. Princeton has a small collection of uh, inscriptions in their seminar room. And so we were going to have um, the Princeton graduate students and faculty, uh, as well as some interested folks from the Institute, um, do this kind of trial run where we'd, you know, have them kind of set up three of their inscriptions. We'd go by with paper and brushes, um, and Nora uh, and Angelos and myself would kind of teach folks how to make a squeeze. Um, and we'd give everyone a chance to, to make these, these squeezes. And, and we were kind of hoping that it would be a trial run, that there'd be so much interest that, you know, we, we wanted to keep it within 15 or 20 people so that the seminar room wouldn't be overcrowded and everyone would have a chance to, to participate. Um, and then if there was a lot of interest, we could run it multiple times. We were really excited that that might be um, a really good option because making squeezes is, is sort of a, a dying art um, as well. So we're hoping to continue that. Yeah. Jeffrey. Yeah, hi. Um, Aaron, could I just go back to your uh, opening historical exposition? Uh, just a question of curiosity. During the Second World War, were these parts of Greece that where the work had been done pre-war uh, first under German or Italian occupation till September 43? And did it matter who the occupier was, was work able to still go on because people who weren't in the military had nothing else to do. How did folks and how did the, um, the archeological uh, artifacts survive the war? Yeah, um, so I think it, it mattered a little bit um, whether it was the Italian occupation or the German occupation, it, mostly because the Italian advance was not very successful, which meant that it went on for a very long period of time and there was extended fighting. Um, and that included some amount of, of aerial bombardment and artillery bombardment. And so those, those areas in Northern Greece and Albania where that mostly took place um, were the, the most uh, worst hit by that particular um, problem. The, the German uh, advance was relatively quick um, and the Greeks had made a point to um, secure the materials in the museums uh, as soon as possible so that those were, were safe held. Um, and I think fortunately because Athens itself was not a prolonged locus of um, struggle. Areas like the Acropolis did not suffer bombing um, or things of that sort. In terms of how much work continued to go on, um, actually the amount of work that went on was significantly decreased, uh, not necessarily because it was made impossible by German occupation, but because many of the archeologists who worked over there uh, became spies for the CSS, um, would eventually become the CIA. Um, so there's a really good book about this uh, and Merritt stayed in the US. Merritt did not go over to, to Greece during this time, uh, but a number of the, the most famous American archeologists um, involved themselves rather directly in the war. The, American School of Classical Studies, the, the building that it has um, is on a street called Suidias, um, which is named for the Red Cross, the, the Swiss Red Cross, um, which occupied that building uh, during, the, during that period. So the, the American Archaeological Institute essentially um, withdrew from the area so that the Red Cross could occupy it. Um, the American school from the US funded an ambulance um, kind of to be used and, and, and operated mostly again by uh, archeologists. So some work continued, but 
Um, most of the the work that was done by archaeologists in Greece during the Nazi occupation was was actually um, military work or relief work. Yeah, Robert. Aaron, were there any other cultures that had the manuscripts carved in the stone so that you have uh, other potential areas for squeezes uh, besides the Greeks? Yeah, absolutely. Um, material carved in stone is is quite quite common. Um, so you can think of um, the Aztec calendar uh, or any number of uh, Meso and, and South American um, societies who were prolific with carving materials uh, into to stone. Um, and actually, I think there's, there is or was someone at the Library of Congress um, who's an expert in Mayan um, epigraphy and, and works on, on that area. Um, we've had several folks come through the Institute in the last couple of years who specialize in Chinese epigraphy. Uh, and so that's another major area where this happens. To my knowledge, um, squeezes are most extensively used in Greco-Roman um, epigraphy. I don't know whether squeezes are at all used in Meso and South American epigraphy. I, I haven't um, had a chance to, to chat with the folks who work in that area. In Chinese epigraphy, they mostly do uh, kind of painted rubbing situation. Um, so we had one of the, the experts in that come over from China um, uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, I kind of, the two of us were able with some amount of translation help to kind of compare notes in the, the respective technologies and, and how they work. So yeah, absolutely. Um, inscriptions like this exist in, in a lot of languages. What exactly each culture chooses to inscribe can vary quite dramatically. Um, and what technologies modern epigraphists use in those areas to preserve them can also vary. Um, but the, the technology of it is quite, um, quite universal. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, please. Hi, Aaron. Um, is it correct uh, that you derive your digital images directly from stones in some cases and in others from uh, another squeeze? And if, if so, do you see a material difference in the quality of the digital image, whether it comes from a stone directly or from a squeeze? That's a great question. So for our for the Crateros project, we're only doing squeezes. Um, in my work, I've done stones as well. So the, the two that I showed, the RTI and the photogrammetry um, scans, those are, are directly of, of stones. Um, there are upsides and downsides to the stone versus squeeze question. Um, it is quite possible for stones to degrade over time, sometimes more so than and a squeeze degrades over time. So you may get a, a good 3D image of a squeeze um, and a good 3D image of the stone as it currently exists and find that uh, on the squeeze, you can see this letter. On the stone, that letter has become illegible. On the flip side, squeezes are imperfect. Um, you know, you may not capture a letter perfectly on, on any given squeeze. And so it is also good to be able to have the, the stone. I think what I would consider the absolute ideal would be having everything. So if you could have the stones digitized and all of the squeeze collections, you know, across the, the world digitized, then you'd be able to look at it and say, ah, I've got five images of this inscription. I know what the stone currently looks like. I've got this one squeeze that was made in 74, this one squeeze that was made in 36, um, and another squeeze that we don't know the exact timing on. You know, now I really have an idea of what the stone looked like over time. I can find the one that I think has the best view of this one letter. I can make my argument about what that letter is. Um, so the real holdup, I think, 
on the stone side of things is that they are huge. They are, you know, heavy and difficult to move. They are geographically spread. And so it is much more uh, expensive and much more of a um, kind of life's work type project to try to get all of the stones digitized as opposed to the squeeze collections, which tend to be centralized to, to a greater or lesser extent uh, and which are much easier to work with. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I'll ask one more question. Um, I learned how to make squeezes from Sterling Dow as an undergraduate. <laughs> and I wonder if there are any other programs today um, in this country actually teaching the art of making squeezes. So as far as I know, there are no programs here um, that in the US that teach squeeze making. It is frequently done in Athens. Um, so if you're at either the British school or the American school, there are frequently opportunities to do squeeze making. Um, it may have been the case that some of it was done at Ohio State while Steve Tracy was there, um, kind of running the Center for Epigraphical and Paleographical Studies. Um, as far as I know, it's it's no longer done there. Um, so no, I think, I think the short answer is that there's not really um, that being done anymore. Um, Sterling Dow is, Dow is a, a, an interesting note because in some of the really early descriptions by merit of his, his plans and work in 35, 36, when he's in um, Britain and Athens, uh, he mentions that they've got this new dig at the Agora and he's in charge of epigraphy and he's got three assistants um, to do the epigraphical work. And Sterling Dow is the first name on that list. It's Sterling Dow, it's uh, James Oliver. Um, and then I can't remember off the top of my head who the third one is, but uh, yeah, Sterling Dow's connection to the, the Agora uh, certainly goes all the way back. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>